Right, uh, well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'll start the lecture now. Um, this is the third of our four lectures on welding. Uh, last week, we spent one lecture looking at welding processes and then a second lecture looking at some small aspects of the physics of welding. Today, we're going to have a look at welding metallurgy. In other words, what happens to the metal alloys that you weld together as a result of the heat that you put in during welding. And what we're going to cover is first of all, we'll step back and look at what we want a require what we want a welded joint to do for us, what the requirements are. We're then going to have a look at the metallurgical zones that develop in a typical welded joint as a result of the differing temperature cycles that different parts of the joint see. We're going to look at the fusion zone, which is where, of course, it melts in a little bit more detail. And then we're going to look at the heat affected zone, which, as you might expect, is just outside the bit where it melts. But, is, but it actually gets hot enough to change the microstructure of the material. And we're going to focus on steel welds. Uh, that's partly because an awful lot of welds that you'll find out in the world are made of steel, and partly because steels have quite interesting metallurgy that you need to be very much aware of if you're welding them up. Um, now, of course, the same is true of other alloy systems like aluminium or titanium, but steel welding is very common across a whole range of industries, and so we'll look at that. We're going to introduce something called the T8-5 cooling time and the carbon equivalent, which are ways of working out whether you need to worry about certain features of the metallurgy of a steel weld, and then we'll summarise it. And hopefully this will be a relatively short lecture again, like last week's uh, physics lecture. So, starting off is what do we want a welded joint to do for us? Well, we must have geometric continuity between the parts that we're joining. That goes without saying. Uh, in other words, you don't want big holes in it or big gaps. Uh, we'll come back to the sort of defects that you can get in a well when it goes wrong tomorrow in the last lecture. Ideally, each microstructural zone within a welded joint should match the strength of the materials that you're joining. If they're not as strong, then you're actually wasting the strength of the materials you're joining together and potentially localizing failures in the weld. If they're stronger than the materials that you're joining, then you're actually wasting strength because you can't really make use of that additional strength. So ideally, you should have material properties that are consistent across a weld. Each microstructural zone within the weld should have an acceptable toughness. Now, you should have met the concept of toughness in materials one. Um, toughness is the ability to absorb energy before it fails. And in the specific case of what's called the fracture toughness, it's the ability to resist the growth of a crack. So a material with a high toughness has a very strong resistance to crack growth and can absorb an awful lot of energy before it disintegrates. A material with a low toughness is brittle. Um, it can break under low energy conditions. And if you have a crack in it, that crack can advance at quite low loads. And generally speaking, a low toughness is extremely undesirable. And also, the welded joint should be free of, free of macroscopic defects, things like cracks, inclu uh, tungsten inclusions, if you've melted your TIG electrode into it, flux inclusions, which we talked about at length in previous lectures, gas pores, and all the other things that can go wrong with the physical geometry of the weld. So those are the sort of things we might want to see a weld have in order for it to be useful to us and to not give us any problems in service. Um, now, welded joint is not homogenous. You can identify a number of different metallurgical zones in a welded joint. At its simplest level, you have a fusion zone in the middle, 
And this is the material that melted during the welding process. So that's a mixture of parent material and the weld filler that you put in there because typically you'll melt as much parent material as you melt filler into a weld bead. So the fusion zone is material that's got hot enough to melt and then it has to solidify and cool down to form the welded joint. Outside the fusion zone, you have an area where it got very hot, but it didn't melt. We call that the heat affected zone. And the reason we call it the heat affected zone is because you've got hot enough to change the microstructure in some way. And we'll show that in some detail for steels later. Outside that, you have a zone of parent material where you hope you haven't actually mucked up the metallurgy by making the welded joint. So this just summarizes what I've just said. The fusion zone is the region that's undergone melting and solidification. In general, it's a mixture of the parent material and the filler metal. We often see it referred to as the weld metal. The heat affected zone, it didn't melt during welding, but the microstructure and its mechanical properties were affected by the thermal cycle because it got hot enough to change them. And the parent material is the stuff you bought from the mill. It came in through the loading bay and its properties haven't changed since because you haven't got it hot enough uh, to make significant changes to its mechanical properties or its microstructure. So those are the three zones, the fusion zone, the heat affected zone and the parent material. So let's start off by looking in a little bit more detail at the fusion zone. Now it's chemical composition, in other words, the alloying elements that you find in the fusion zone is determined primarily by three factors. It's the composition of the filler metal, in other words, the filler wire that you're putting in there or the metal in the consumable electrode has a particular chemical composition, a particular alloy composition. The parent materials that you're joining will have a particular chemical composition um, and they mix together. So the other factor is this thing we call the dilution, which is just a way of measuring how much filler metal on average and how much parent material on average go in to form the welded joint. Now, the chemical composition of the filler metal has often been mucked around with. Um, uh, you make changes to produce material microstructures in the fusion zone that end up with acceptable mechanical properties for the cooling rates that you're likely to experience during welding. And I'll come back to that for steel wells later. But basically, you've made some changes to try and make sure that when it cools down fast from the molten condition, it doesn't produce uh, a microstructure with undesirable mechanical properties. So that's the, few, the filler metal. Um, now, of course, you don't quite get there because you mix parent material in there. But of course, you design that filler chemical composition with an awareness that you'll be melting parent material into the weld pool as well. Now, the grain structure, the microstructure within the fusion zone is often influenced by the shape of the weld pool and the direction of the heat flow. Um, because you remember that you get different shapes of weld pool depending upon the welding process that you're uh, using. So a keyhole weld made using laser and EB will be thin and narrow. That's the same thing actually, isn't it? Narrow and thin are the same thing, but it tends to be deep and narrow. The fusion zone for an arc weld tends to be broader and shallower. And you'll also remember that it can be very broad and shallow if you get um, surface tension forces dominating electromagnetic forces. So the convection currents run outwards and it can be deep and, and somewhat deeper and somewhat narrower if the electromagnetic forces dominate the surface tension forces and convection runs in the other direction. And the grain structure you get when all of these solidify uh, is often influenced by that shape and by the direction of heat flow into the material from the fusion zone. Now, because of that, in some cases, we can develop something we call weld metal texture. And what that means 
is that the grains in the structure have a bias. Their crystallographic orientations tend to run in a particular direction and they tend to have shapes that run in a particular direction. Now you remember we met that in forming as well, where if you forge something or roll it, you elongate the grains and often in forging, you want to do that because you're trying to align the material. So in rolling, you're tending to align the material properties. In forging, you try and get a grain flow around the shape of the forging in order that you don't expose uh, areas of the structure that have slightly lower mechanical properties. But in weld metal, this is sometimes undesirable, but you're developing texture because of the way it solidifies. And as a result of that, you can get significant anisotropy. Its stiffness can be different in different directions and its strength, just as we met when we looked at deep drawing, where you took cold rolled plate, which was anisotropic, and you found you formed ears when you drew it because its mechanical properties were different in different directions. Exactly the same thing can happen in weld metal. You end up with direction dependent mechanical properties, which may or may not be a bad thing. So let's look a little bit closer at dilution. Now here we have a simple plate butt weld. So what we've done is we've melted filler metal and we've melted a bit of the parent material. We started out with two rectangular plates that we butted up with a preparation on the end to a V preparation to accept the weld filler that we're gonna melt into it. So we'll define dilution as the proportion of the fusion zone that's been contributed by the parent materials. And it's often expressed as a percentage. So what that means is, if we look at what happened when we made this weld, you can see a dotted line there. And that was what started out as parent material. Before we melted it, the parent material extended as far as those dotted lines. We melted filler material in there, that melted some of the parent material, the heat flow melted some of the parent material, and you end up with a mixture of the two. So that cross-sectional area of the material that's deposited is A. The cross-sectional area of the parent material that's melted is B. In other words, B is, and if you can see the uh, mouse, is this area here between the dotted lines and the fusion boundary. In other words, you've melted parent material back to the edge of the fusion boundary. And the material that's deposited is what's left. That area there is filler, is how much filler metal went in. And so the dilution is defined as B over A plus B. So it's the cross-sectional area of the parent material that's melted, B, divided by the total cross-sectional area of the completed weld. And that will give you a measure of the proportion of parent material that you've melted into that weld. And typically for an arc weld, uh, if you lay a single weld bead down on a plate, you'll melt uh, the final weld, be uh, final weld fusion zone. The final weld is 50% parent material, 50% weld filler. Uh, and what you then get after that depends on geometry for different um, welding processes and joint, uh, joint geometries and things like that. But it can be significant. So if you're doing a multi-pass weld, what you'll often find is the first root bead that you put down um, will have a 50% dilution. And then after that, because you're laying weld beads on top of each other, some of them will be melting parent material from the side in plus weld filler from underneath. And so you find the dilution decreases as you move up the weld and then stabilizes at some lower value. But that's the definition. D is the cross-sectional area of the parent material that's been melted divided by the total cross-sectional area of the final weld bead or weld metal. And the point about that is sometimes we need to try and control it because if we don't, we end up with the wrong chemical composition in our weld fusion zone. And as a result of that, we get undesirable microstructures and we get undesirable mechanical properties.
Okay, weld metal texture in the fusion zone. Now that diagram on the right shows the fusion boundary here and below there we have the grains in the heat affected zone which have not melted and those grains tend to be all sorts of different orientations so their crystallographic orientations are just shown by these crossed lines um, they may have grown because of heating during um, welding but they tend to have random orientations above the fusion line you find that isn't the case and that's because of how it solidifies so this is something that's called heterogeneous solidification and it's very common in casting and welding so you may well have met it already in the casting part of the lectures basically what happens is at the fusion boundary initially the atoms that solidify solidify on the exposed planes of the existing grains that are still solid and so those existing grains start to grow into the weld pool because the bet the easiest place for something to come out of uh, the liquid phase is to fit in to a lattice structure that, that would fit onto and grow a lattice structure that's already there so initially they start to grow into the weld pool but this doesn't carry on because what you find is that grains with a particular crystal orientation, so with their 100 orientation parallel to the direction of heat flow, and the heat flow is from top to bottom here, they grow faster. And that means they overtake grains with less favorable orientations. And so you can see this is happening. So these ones have got favorable orientations, they just keep on growing. These have got unfavorable, so they grow slower. And as a result, the others overtake them and the, the solidification front leaves them behind. And so what you see is a whole series of what we call columnar grains growing in from the fusion boundary. Uh, and as a result of that columnar grain structure, all the grains tend to have the same crystallographic orientation and you end up with anisotropy because their elastic properties and plastic properties are different in different directions. This is very common in electron beam welds because they have very, very high temperature gradients and you tend to see a beautiful layer of columnar grains growing in from each side of that very thin um, weld. And where they meet in the middle, you sometimes get a row of equiax grains. So this is very common. Weld metal texture caused by prefer preferential heterogeneous solidification. So that's the, the weld metal. Let's move on to the heat affected zone. Now this doesn't melt, but it does undergo microstructural changes because it's got hot enough for this sort of thing to happen. And depending upon what you're welding and whether or not you heat treated it prior to welding it, is how significant this is, is whether you make a horrible mess of your beautifully constructed and heat treated alloy or whether actually it doesn't make much difference at all and you don't need to worry about it. Now, in contrast to the fusion zone, um, you don't actually have much you can do uh, to mitigate the effects of the welding thermal cycle on the microstructure other than post-weld heat treatment, which will come back later, because you can't change the parent material um, chemical composition once you've decided to weld it. The heat affected zone chemical composition is that of the parent material. Whereas the weld, you can choose a filler composition that you melt in so that once you've worked out the dilution, the chemical composition of the weld pool is such that when it solidifies and cools down, it will produce an acceptable microstructure and acceptable mechanical properties. So the heat affected zone is dangerous. Um, it's often the most problematic region in the welded joint and it's prone to various forms of cracking. Um, we won't talk about it here, but there's a well-known alloy used for steam pipe work in power stations called P91, uh, which has got 9% chrome in it. And when that was introduced into service, 
people didn't realize that a particular region of the heat affected zone was very prone to creep cracking once it went into high temperature service and there were cases of the entire steam systems of power stations having to be replaced after a year or so's operation because the heat affected zones of all the p91 welds cracked because people hadn't treat hadn't well well they welded it then they hadn't heat treated it properly afterwards so this can be a real problem okay let's look at the heat affected zone in a steel weld now in a little bit more detail um now the reason we're looking at steel is because different crystal structures are stable in iron at different temperatures. Um, uh, we're going to look at that in a little bit more detail now. If you remember from materials one, at high temperatures, a steel with a very large amount, of, uh, a low alloy steel, so one that doesn't have clever alloying, too much in the way of clever alloying elements, uh, this has a stable phase at high temperature that we call austenite. So above about 850 degrees centigrade, iron is thermodynamically stable in a face center cubic configuration. And we call that austenite. And austenite can dissolve up to 2% by weight of carbon in it. So uh, carbon can exist in what we call solid solution in iron. And what that means is the carbon atoms are fitting into little holes in the lattice between the iron atoms and austenite can fit about 2% by weight of carbon atoms in before no more will go in, in a thermodynamic sense. Uh, in other words, it's not thermodynamically stable. And then the carbon actually combines with iron in a chemical compound, which you find elsewhere. So austenite occurs at high temperature is face center cubic and can dissolve about 2% carbon in it in solid solution. So it's still a single phase material because the carbon's in solution. Below about 700, the stable phase of iron is ferrite. And this is body center cubic, um, a different crystal structure which you've encountered before. Ferrite can't dissolve very much carbon. It doesn't have, its interstitial spaces are actually smaller and less frequent than the interstitial spaces in austenite. And as a result, you very often find in an engineering steel alloy that you have ferrite existing with a mixture of ferrite and iron carbide which we call perlite. And I'll tell you a little bit more about you later. But the first message to take away is that at low temperature, iron is ferritic. At high temperature, it's austenitic. And the other take home message is that changes between these two um, happen most easily if you heat it or cool it very slowly, because that allows you to achieve thermodynamic equilibrium. Because when the crystal structures change from what's there at low temperature to what's there at high temperature, they change because of atomic diffusion. And atomic diffusion needs time to take place. And we'll see later that if you don't give enough time to reach a thermodynamic stable state, thermodynamically stable state, you get all sorts of other things going on. So let's look at this in a little more detail. Here is the iron carbon equilibrium diagram, which I'm hoping you will have seen before. The x-axis is the weight percent of carbon in the alloy. The y-axis is the temperature. So at low temperature, between 0 and 2% of carbon, the stable forms you have there are ferrite, the body center cubic form of iron, with a little bit of carbon dissolved in it, and a a compound called Fe3C, three iron atoms uh, together with car one carbon atom called iron carbide. Above this range of temperatures, it's single phase. It's just austenite. And that's because austenite can dissolve up to 2% of carbon uh, without having to form uh, a second phase, which means when you heat up a steel in this range, 
to form austenite, eventually all that iron carbide dissolves into the austenite. Um, and the, the sequence it goes through depends upon whether there's only a little bit of carbon, or whether there's a lot of carbon. So that's the phase diagram. And again, I'm hoping that you would have seen that before. And this tells you what happens if things happen very slowly, if you heat or cool very slowly. So up here, we've got a single phase, austenite. Down here, we've got two phases, austenite and ferrite. And down here, we've got two phases, ferrite and cementite. So if you cool this austenite down, if you start up here and cool this austenite down, if it's got less than about 0.88% carbon, first of all, ferrite grains nucleate on the grain boundaries of the austenite and the ferrite grains gradually start to grow. And eventually the carbon content of the austenite uh, reaches saturation and the rest of the iron and carbon transform to cementite, which is a second phase. And the physical organization you get there, I'll show you on the next slide. So let's go back and have a, have a look at what happens when you cool slowly. You start out with austenite, and austenite's got all the carbon in solution. If it's got less than 0.8% carbon, then when you cool it down, you'll end up with ferrite, which is what comes out first, which has got a little bit of carbon in it. And then you have perlite, which is layers, lamellae, of iron and cementite. So that's a two-phase structure. If you have a 0.8 weight percent of carbon, it's what's called eutectoid, which means when it transforms from austenite to the lower temperature phases, ferrite and cementite, all of it is organized as perlite, these little layers of iron and iron carbide. If it's got more than 0.8% carbon, then there actually isn't enough ferrite to form the layers of ferrite and cementite that we call perlite, and instead you get lumps of iron carbide in there. Now the sorts of steels that we weld tend to be over on the left-hand side, uh, so that's only of academic interest during welding. Okay, so high temperature, low temperature. So you can see that if once you've got the chemical composition, if you move very slowly, you know what you're gonna get, depending upon the chemical composition, either uh, ferrite and perlite, or just perlite, or perlite and cementite. Remember, perlite is a mixture of ferrite and cementite. So I'm hoping you would have seen that before. Now, one of the features you have is that if you increase the amount of carbon in a steel, so it gets stronger, its yield strength goes up because there are more obstacles to dislocation motion in there. But the converse is that it gets more brittle, its toughness falls. So you can see that as with all these things, there is a trade-off. If strength is really important to you, you might go with something with quite a lot of carbon in it. If toughness is important, then you might have to go with something with a lower amount of carbon. So that's equilibrium. Things happen very slowly. Now, welding is very, very non-equilibrium. And if I show you this picture, this is the heat affected zone in a typical steel. And what this shows is a little diagram down on the bottom showing the fusion zone with its aligned, elongated anisotropic grains. We have what we call the coarse grained heat affected zone. Then we have the fine grained heat affected zone. Then we have the partially transformed or intercritical heat affected zone. Then we have a zone we call over tempered. And then we have a zone we call unaffected. And over here, you can see the peak temperature that you reach during welding. So if you reached a peak temperature of 1500, you mel melted it. If you reached a peak temperature of 1100, you generated a coarse grained has, and I'll explain what that is in a minute. If you got above this temperature called AC3, 
everything transforms to austenite during heating. So you've got fine grained austenite, which then cooled down. Um, in this region between what we call AC1 and AC3, you've only transformed some of the, the parent material into austenite. You've taken it up into a region where it's in equilibrium terms, it's a mixture of the two. So some of it turned into austenite and then did something on the way down. Some of it remained as britic. And then we have what we call the, the over-tempered region, which is above about 650, where if you're not careful, even though you don't turn some or all of it into austenite, you may affect its mechanical properties by cooking it a bit too long. So the take home message is that the microstructure in the heat affected zone of a steel weld varies according to the extent to which austenite forms during welding. And so basically everywhere um, to the what you might call to the left of the AC1 temperature, at least some austenite forms during welding. In the intercritical has, some of it transforms to austenite and some of it remains fritic. In the fine grained heat affected zone, it all transforms to austenite, but it doesn't get hot enough for the austenite grains to start to grow. In the coarse grained heat affected zone, it all transformed to austenite and it got hot enough that those austenite grains start to grow because there's uh, basically grain boundaries are high energy things. So thermodynamically, you don't want them. So if you get it hot enough, then you can activate processes that make austenite grains grow and swallow each other up and reduce their total energy that way. So you end up with an intercritical has, which is a mixture of austenite and ferrite at high temperatures. A fine grained has where it's all turned to austenite, but it hasn't started to grow and a coarse grained has where it started to grow. So that's a detail. The reason we mention the coarse grained has in very often in a steel weld, that's the region most prone to embrittlement. And you'll see why later. The over tempered zone, as I said, doesn't have any austenization but it is softened by the welding cycle. In other words, you've had a parent material that you've heat treated to make it strong, and now you've got it hot enough that you've softened it because you've dissolved precipitates or coarsened precipitates or something like that. Okay, that is the heat affected zone. Now, one of the reasons it's so complicated is because we end up with non-equilibrium transformations. In other words, what we get is not what we saw on that equilibrium phase diagram, it's something else. Um, because in order to transform from austenite when cooling down to ferrite and perlite, you must allow sufficient time for the iron and carbon atoms to diffuse. If you don't give them sufficient time, you won't form ferrite and perlite. They'll get stuck in some other configuration, and that may be an undesirable one. Now, heat affected zones in welding tend to cool rapidly because what you've done is you've melted a zone and then you've got a component which is cold acting as a heat sink. So heat flows rapidly away from that molten zone. And of course the weld torch might be moving quite quickly away from the weld pool that you formed. So you end up with quite rapid cooling in heat affected zones. So diffusion cannot occur. So you don't get equilibrium microstructures. Now, the worst case of this is if you cool it fast enough, nothing can move. So you've got all that carbon inside the austenite lattice and it can't move around to form iron carbides. It can't get out of the way to form iron carbide when you transform to the body center cubic thing, because you just haven't given the carbon atoms time to move. And basically you trap them and you trap them in the crystal lattice and the austenite transforms to a hard brittle phase that we call martensite. And martensite is basically distorted ferrite. So rather than diffusion, you get a sort of shear transformation 
of the lattice with carbon trapped in it. So this is a little bit of detail, but there's no diffusion happened, but you've managed to jump into a lower energy state. Um, and this is martensite. So on the right, you can see a body cent, what looks like a body center cubic crystal structure. Uh, so there's one atom at each corner and there's one atom right in the middle. Now, if this was ferrite, all three dimensions of that unit cube would be the same. But because it's martensite, we basically trapped carbon atoms at these points X. So the three dimensions are, diff are two of them are the same. Those two at the bottom are the same as you would expect in, in ferrite. But this one here is elongated. We call it body centered tetragonal. Um, and um, this has three characteristics. It's hard, it has a very high yield strength because all those, the, the elongated lattice and the presence of the carbon atoms make it very difficult to move dislocations through it. Because it's hard, has a high yield strength, it's also brittle, it has a low toughness. Um, and it has a very fine grain size. So the high hardness and the brittleness are due to the carbon trapped in the solution. The small grain size is because you've un you cool this so fast that you delay nucleation of the new phases. So lots and lots of nucleations occur all at once when you finally reach a very low temperature where you it has to happen. And so you get small grains. If you nucle if you cool very slowly, then then you nucleate relatively slowly, you give things lots of time to grow. So you tend to have coarse grains. But Martin site is very fine grain because you've cooled it really, really fast. When it nucleates, it nucleates everywhere at once. And so you get very small grains. And there's a picture of the grain structure there where this is a prior austenite grain. That's the austenite grain that was there before it started transforming. You have these blocks of martensite, which have a lath-like structure. So that's martensite. Um, that's just a note, which I've already told you, a supersaturated BCC lattice that's elongated at one axis, and we call it body center tetragonal. Okay, so that's martensite. Now, how do we know whether we're going to form martensite or not. Well, we use something called a continuous cooling transformation diagram. Um, this is something that we use based upon experiment um, and sometimes on theory uh, to predict the phases that will form when austenite transforms on cooling. So we want to know if I cool austenite at a particular cooling rate, what will I get? Um, so they plot the extent to which a transformation has taken place as a function of temperature and time. And you use those when the cooling rate's too fast for thermodynamic equilibrium. In other words, you use them for welding. Um, you can actually use them for casting as well if the cooling is fast enough. The transformation start and transformation finish lines on a CC type diagram are very sensitive to changes in the composition of the steel. I'll come back to that later once I've shown you what a CCT diagram looks like. And this is a continuous cooling transformation diagram for a low alloy steel. So the y-axis is the temperature. The x-axis is the log of time. So what you do is you'll start with austenite at a high temperature and you'll cool it at a given rate. So that austenite will follow a trajectory that runs across this diagram from top left to bottom right as it cools down. And you plot on the diagram the start and the finish times for the different microstitic constituents, different phases that you might form. So if we add a little bit to this, austenite is stable at high temperature so that is something like the eutectoid temperature for steel, which is the, the temperature above which it's austenite stable rather than ferrite stable. And then we, yes, there you go, the eutectoid temperature. Um, 
and we can plot the start and finish times for ferrite and perlite here. So that's this is forming near equilibrium or equilibrium stuff, ferrite and perlite. You've then got the start and finish for something we call bayonite, which I'll explain later. And then we've got the start and finish for martensite. So why does it look like that? Well, let's plot some cooling uh, trajectories on there. This is a slow cooling trajectory. So if this is the log of time, you could imagine that by the time you're out here, this is a very slow cooling rate. This is a few degrees per second, or maybe only one degree per second, or no, actually probably less than that for a steel, 0.1, something like that. So this is near equilibrium condition. So you see you start with austenite, you cross the eutectoid temperature when thermodynamically ferrite becomes the stable phase, but you have to have some driving force for diffusion. So there'll be a little bit of a drop in temperature and then you nucleate ferrite and perlite and they start to grow and the temperature will fall and then eventually it will finish at a lower temperature and a longer time. So a slow cool, you form ferrite and perlite, which is tough. Lower yield strength, higher toughness, more ductility. If you cool at an intermediate rate, and remember this is our log plot, so you're talking 5, 10, 20 degrees centigrade per second, you form something called bayonite. And this is an intermediate phase. And what happens here, it's still a mixture of ferrite and cementite, but rather than the cementite being arranged in those little layers in perlite, it comes out as little precipitates, as much smaller carbide precipitates dotted through a ferrite matrix because it doesn't have time to form perlite. You have time to diffuse carbon to form cementite, but you don't have time to organize it like you would if it was equilibrium. So that's an intermediate phase, bayonite. If you cool really fast, no diffusion, you form martensite, which is hard and brittle. So you can see how the diagram allows you to see what's going on. If you know the cooling rate in your heat affected zone, you can make an estimate of what you're going to form. Generally speaking, bayonite is good because bayonite has a relatively high strength and a high toughness. And a lot of low alloy steels are heat treated to make them bayonitic anyway. You don't want them to be ferrite and perlite. You want them to be bayonitic. So they'll have been quenched and tempered beforehand. OK. So that's a continuous cooling transformation diagram. Now, there are a number of things you can use as guides for whether you're likely to have problems forming martensite in the world. One of them is this thing we call the T85 cooling time. So the transformation of austenite to ferrite and perlite becomes possible when you get below about 800, because that's when thermodynamics says that ferrite becomes the stable phase. If you actually get down to 500 or below, then diffusion rates are starting to drop significantly, which means that you risk not being able to diffuse things to form carbides anymore. So the time that you take to cool from 800 to 500 will have an important bearing on the likelihood of forming brittle phases like martensite. Very simple. So the T85 cooling time is the time to cool between 800 and 500 degrees centigrade. And people often estimate it for a welding process to see how much risk they've got of forming a brittle phase. If you increase that cooling time, you decrease the risk of forming martensite. If you think back to that continuous cooling diagram, you're cooling slower, so you're moving over to the right when you're moving down, so you're more likely to intersect the bayonite lines than the martensite lines, which is a good thing. So let's go back to our CCT diagram. Um, the other thing we need to worry about is other alloying elements, because I've just been talking about carbon, but we put all sorts of other things into steels for various reasons. And what you find is 
If you increase the alloy content, in other words, you put more manganese or molybdenum or chromium and things like that in, you move the continuous cooling diagram to the right because you're putting more obstacles in and you're having more atoms that need to rearrange themselves. If you decrease the alloy content, you move it to the left. So as you increase the amount of alloying elements, you're more likely to form martensite. If you decrease them, you're less likely. And that's because more rearrangement is required with more with higher alloying elements. More rearrangement means more time and more time means more risk of getting trapped and being not transformed before you get to such a low temperature that you form martensite. So increasing alloy content, which you do for all sorts of good reasons, may mean you have more trouble in your heat affected zone. Decreasing it means you potentially have less, which means uh, steels with very low alloying contents and low carbon contents are very easy to weld. If you make them higher, they become more difficult to weld. And this is reflected in something we call the carbon equivalent formula. So basically, we can work out something we call the carbon equivalent. Uh, engineers like single numbers, uh, not complicated stuff. So the combined influence of all the alloying elements on the likelihood of forming brittle phases and therefore the likelihood of cracking during cooling is quantified through something we call the carbon equivalent. And this is something which has been worked out empirically by welding engineers over many years. Uh, there are different forms of it around. The one I've got there is one that's due to the American Welding Society. So the carbon equivalent is the percentage of carbon plus the percentage of manganese and silicon divided by six. So those are about six times less effective than carbon in promoting martensite formation plus the percentage of chromium plus molybdenum plus vanadium over five. So they're, they again about five times less effective and then percentage of copper plus percentage of nickel over 15. So this is uh, very often worked out for low alloy steels because you can then compare two low alloy steels quite quickly and say, yeah, this one's got a higher carbon equivalent. So I need to be more careful when I weld it. Um, if the carbon equivalent is less than about 0.35. In other words, if it's a plain carbon steel with less than 0.35%, um, then you'll get few problems for the cooling rates to be experienced during arc welding. Okay, so this is experience. So a question arises of, well, what about laser welding and EB welding, um, which can have different cooling rates? If it's greater than that, if it's greater than about 0.5, then you start having to take precautions of various sorts, which we won't go into in this course. So that's what the carbon equivalent does. It gives you an idea about whether you're going to have trouble welding the thing uh, because of the likelihood of forming brittle phases. OK, so that's the end of what we want to talk about today. So just to summarise, we've got three distinct metallurgical reasons in regions in a, a weld, the fusion zone, the heat affected zone and unaffected pair of material. Now, the chemical composition of the fusion zone is determined by the composition of the filler metal, the composition of the substrate and the dilution of the filler metal by the substrate. And you often choose the composition of the filler material in order to avoid the formation of brittle microstructures or cracks in the fusion zone. The heat affected zone is often the most problematic region in a weld. In a steel weld, you need to take care to avoid the formation of brittle phases like martensite, which can have inadequate toughness. So there's some simple take home messages there. Obviously, the content of the lecture has got more in it, but that's all we need to say, I think, at this stage about welding metallurgy. OK, thank you. We've got time for Oh, a few questions. I'll just stop sharing. So if, we, if, if there are any questions, then I can answer them now. Failing that, we might have time at the end of tomorrow's session. And of course, we've got the drop in session on Wednesday evening at six o'clock. Alex.
Uh, will this week's content be used in the test? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yes, to just to expand on that, we finished the course in its completion tomorrow and you're tested on Friday. So yes. Can I can I ask you a question, please? Yes, certainly. Um so I'm on I'm on slides, I think it's 10, and I'm looking at the phase diagram. Uh, and I can see um gamma, alpha, and FE3 FE three C. Yes. Uh, which Sorry, is also very, I, very inefficient way of going through the slides. Uh, I've not put it up yet, have I? Just bear with me because we've right there we I'm go. Just, I'm just, just, okay. If I can explain it without showing you this diagram, that's probably the best. But I'm confused what the difference really is between well, what perlite is really because yeah, that's the one. Yeah. So perlite, it, the 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 phases, the thermodynamically stable phases are ferrite which is body-centered iron with a little bit of carbon dissolved in it. And the other st thermodynamically stable phase is iron carbide, which is a chemical compound with three, carb three iron atoms and one carbon atom. So the whole of that bottom region, which you can see there, has got ferrite and cementite as its stable phases. But the arrangement of them you get when you cool the austenite down, depends upon the, chem the, the amount of carbon you've got in it. Because the way it actually uh, changes phase is that if you've got less than 0.8% carbon in it, as you cool it down from A into B, the first thing that happens is ferrite starts to come out. And that ferrite gradually grows because it's got a lower solubility for carbon, the carbon in the ferrite is rejected into the austenite. And then when the carbon composition of the austenite reaches a critical value, it all, all the austenite transforms into cementite. Um, or at least it starts to trans, sorry, it transforms into a mixture of cementite of, and ferrite. And what you see in the microstructure is you have this bit thing we call perlite and that's got layers of cementite and ferrite in it and it's because once you've reached a certain chemical composition in the carbon composition in the austenite when it trans what you're transforming into is this mixture of ferrite and cementite and they are arranged in layers so it's an organizational thing perlite isn't a phase it's an organization of iron carbide and ferrite in layers. Okay, thank you. That was really helpful. Yeah. So I obviously, yeah. obviously didn't explain it correctly the first time. Around. Oh, so many people have tried. I just don't understand. But that's it's much clearer now. Okay. Any more questions? No. Okay. In that case, we'll stop. I'll see you all for the last lecture tomorrow at four p.m. Um, and um, there may be time at the end of that for some questions, but failing that, we've got the Wednesday evening session at 6 p.m. Um, and thus far, I think I've had one or two people turn up who've had a one hour personal tutorial. So if anyone else wants to come, then do. Uh, so thanks very much, everyone, and I will see you tomorrow. <laughs>